This is the tiny nation of Kiribati, 100,000 people living on 310 square miles of 32 atolls and one raised coral island, separated by an astonishing 3.5 million square kilometres of sea. It's a tropical paradise, breathtakingly beautiful, but it's poor, making most of its money from tourism, fishing and coconut exports. It's also one of the world's leading nations when it comes to protecting the natural world, and it has good reason to be. You better enjoy Kiribati whilst it lasts, because according to the government, it's likely to be completely gone by 2050. Rising sea levels leading to increased coastal erosion mean these islands are likely to become the first nation entirely disappeared as a result of climate change. Kiribati has a fascinating history. A popular spot for slavers and merchants from the 1600s, it was absorbed into the British Empire in the 19th century. It was the scene of the Battle of Tarawa, one of the most brutal of World War II, which saw well over 6,000 American and Japanese troops and thousands of construction labourers killed in just three days. It was used for nuclear tests by the British and Americans in the 1950s and 60s, before gaining independence in 1979. And the island's precarious fight for survival is far from over. The government has become the first in the world to announce a total national evacuation plan. In 2008, they applied to Australia and New Zealand to accept Kiribati citizens as permanent refugees, with President Anote Tong saying that the country had reached the point of no return and that they had to start preparing for the day when there was no country left. This is a small, low-lying place. Coastal erosion is happening, sea levels are rising, and there is, quite simply, nowhere else for the people to go. So what do you do with the population of an entire nation? Well, to begin with, the government's begun sponsored programmes to send its citizens to Australia and New Zealand to work as nurses, where they'll learn skills, send money back home, and eventually be able to afford to evacuate their families into a new life where they're already integrated with their host nation. They've also bought a 22 square kilometre estate in Fiji, which was, it was originally reported, to house the national population. That's been denied. Instead, they say they plan to open a business and investment park there, but to the same ends, to create an economic and cultural colony where the population can go, prosper, and eventually take their families. It's a laudable policy, but then they've got roughly 30 years to sort themselves out, and a small population with an easily abandoned subsistence economy where people produce just enough for themselves. Imagine this happening with the 16 million people of the Netherlands, for example, or in fact any of the large coastal cities of the world, and most of them have no plans at all. Either way, Kiribati's story is a tragedy, and it's one that's facing many small South Pacific island chains. But through adversity comes enlightenment, and Kiribati is determined to make a difference whilst it can. In 2006, the country created the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, one of the largest marine conservation areas in the world, with over 408,000 square kilometres of ocean, comprising some of the only pristine reefs on Earth. That is, places where humans have no impact, where fish are primarily eaten by sharks, not us where coral thrives, but until now, large-scale fishing was banned in just 3% of the park. As of next year, though, all commercial fishing in the area will be outlawed. All commercial fishing in one of the world's largest and fastest growing tuna harvesting spots, an area the size of California. Why? Well, it's partly to protect the country's fishing revenue whilst it still exists. Where experiments like this have occurred elsewhere, the marine reserves act almost as a fish factory. Dwindling species thrive there and spread out again into areas which can be fished, meaning that overall, stocks are far higher. And with 12% of the world's population relying on fishing for an income and just 2% of the ocean currently protected, that is a promising model. But most importantly, Kiribati is doing it to protect the environment whilst it can. President Tong told the R Ocean Conference in the US that inaction is no longer an option and that something must be done. And coming from a country that's already accepted its own fate, that's pretty incredible. Rather than tearing the heart out of its environment for short-term gain, the doomed country is taking a huge economic hit on its key industry to protect what it can whilst it can. So that when the people are gone, there's still something left. And all this coming from a fishing nation surviving on the breadline. 
take note, bigger nations, because this is probably the most sad and noble thing any government has ever done.